Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Tuesday afternoon program with the Genealogy Center. I am super excited to have all of you here this afternoon to learn a little bit about the Irish diaspora. Uh, so our speaker today is the one and only me, Elizabeth Hodges. I am a senior librarian here at the Genealogy Center, and I have been here for a couple years now. Uh, my first master's degree actually was in Irish history. So that's why I am super excited to just talk a little bit about a historical context with all of you. Okay. So today's program, I hope you guys are seeing the correct monitor, uh, the correct screen is why they left a conversation about the Irish diaspora. So as I said, uh, towards the beginning of the program, uh, I, my first master's degree was actually not in library science. It was specifically in Irish history. So it's something that I am very passionate about. Uh, and I want to have this program be an opportunity for you guys to get a little historical context to add to your family story, to add to some of the records you're finding. And it might give you clues to find more records. So diaspora, okay. So the word diaspora is definitely a big heavy word that I've noticed a lot of people might not exactly know exactly what it means, but here's a, just the, the definition, which is the movement, migration, or scattering of a people away from an established or ancestral homeland. Uh, because of kind of the nature of this de definition, it's usually a word you see when you're reading about, say, like the Jewish diaspora or the African diaspora, because it implies the movement by both choice and forced migration. Uh, now, the Irish diaspora is very, very big. Uh, there are more people in the United States, for example, who claim Irish heritage. So I think it's the average is about 40 million. That's way more than the number of people that actually live in Ireland. So it's a, it's a big group of people that we all kind of share this culture, this you know, kind of tragic history, right? Uh, and I wanna talk about why, why are people leaving? So we're going to go over some of those push and pull factors. Okay, so I know all of y'all are thinking, we came to a program about Ireland. Why is this crazy lady talking about gumbo? I promise there's a reason. So when I think of how historical context enhances my research, I think of it much the same way that I think of gumbo. So for those of you who might not necessarily know me, um, I am originally from Louisiana, so I kind of relate everything in my life to food. Uh, but gumbo, it always begins with the root, right? So that in the frame of our research, right? So that is the con, that is going to be uh, the foundational records, right? That's going to give us the important things like the names, the dates, uh, the places of marriage. So those are going to be the basis of your family story. Now, the holy trinity of Cajun and Creole cooking that is going to be your historical context. So uh, that is going to be, you know, Holy Trinity, that's your onions, your green bell peppers, your celery. That's adding flavor and color to your ancestor's story. But when it's cooked down together with the roux, the result is just savory perfection. So since, like I said, my first master's was specifically in Irish history, like I said, we are going to get into some of that nitty gritty historical context for what was going on in Ireland at different points in time, in the hopes that you can use some of this info to find clues for finding records. Because I know if any of you have been doing Irish genealogy for more than five minutes, you'll know it's hard. It's, it's, it is hard. And a lot of that has to do with record loss, uh, which I have a program actually at the very end of the month uh, about a project called uh, Beyond 2022, where they created a virtual record treasury to try to recreate what was lost in a fire in 1922 in the public records office. It's not everything that we hoped it would be, but it is something. So if you're interested in that, tune in. That will be the last Tuesday of this month. So hope, I also want to mention that the handout, which I know Sarah has put links to that in the chat a couple of times, I included a ton of resources to get you started 
finding your Irish family back in Ireland. And I hope that y'all can use that as a guide to refer back to as you're researching. All right, so what was happening in Ireland? So there's kind of a lot going on and we can't cover all of Irish history in, in the span of a program, it's just not possible. But we're gonna kind of hit the highlights. Uh, there were multiple famines. There were actually three major famines, which we'll get into in, a, in just a moment. There's a lot of economic disparity and just greater opportunity elsewhere. Um, what group will see the most opportunity elsewhere will kind of vary depending on the era. Uh, now, agrarian unrest, that has to do with land. Um, so to put things into perspective, in 1870, over 50% of Ireland, of the whole island, was owned by only 750 families. So you will have issues of mass evictions that you'll see during the Great Famine in the 1840s. Uh, you'll have issues of inheritance where before 1845, uh, the land that you are inheriting, so to speak, you're inheriting the right to occupy. You're not inheriting the land itself because most people did not own their land. So the way it used to be was that that land was divided amongst all of the heirs equally. After the 1850s, it becomes a one heir uh, system where you might have five children, but only the eldest boy usually would inherit, leaving the rest of the children with really nothing. Uh, so there's there's a lot of disparity with that, and that's going to push people out as well, uh, and just also violence. There's there's a lot going on in Ireland. You know, every twenty to thirty years, there's a, a new rebellion of some sort, uh, going all the way back to the 1600s to Crom to Cromwell, uh, and then again in 1798. We with every new little spout of violence, uh, the Irish people, they're gonna lose a little bit more. They're gonna lose a little more. And while that might not be for the majority of people leaving Ireland at different points, that might not be the, the main reason why someone's gonna leave, but it's a factor, right? It's something to consider. So let's talk about the famines. So the, the first famine I wanna bring up is was only for a year. It was from 1740 to 1741. In that one year, 13 to 20 percent of the population died. Population at that point was 2.4 million people. That is a lot of people, a large percentage, I should say, in just one year. Now, that famine combined with a serious drought that would go on for about a decade after that, that would be the primary cause of Irish immigration in the 1740s. Before that, that has more to do with uh, Presbyterians wanting to leave, uh, usually because they would be considered the minority. So that would be your Scots-Irish. They're going to leave before and after this uh, just because they had better opportunity uh, in places like in the colonies, basically. Now the next famine, this is the big one that everyone knows about. So this is gonna be from around 1845 to 1852, 1855-ish. Uh, most refer to it as the Great Hunger or Angorta Moor as the Irish call it. Uh, over a million people died, 2.1 million people fled. You're gonna have at the same time mass evictions. So that's going to add into the wide scale death. So a lot of people kicked off of their land. Um, you're gonna have a lot of people who are very sick. So there's also a cholera epidemic at the same time. It's not a great cheery place to live. Uh, of the 2.1 million that left, 1.8 went to North America. Of that number, 300,000 went to Canada. But uh, in 1847, which is known as Black 47, 45.6% Four, of the total immigration to the United States was coming from Ireland. And then later on, you're going to have another famine. This is in 1879. Uh, it's, they refer to it as a mini famine, uh, sometimes called Angorta Bug, so a little famine. Uh, that wasn't quite as bad because by that point, you had established immigration set up 
Uh, and it just, it wasn't nearly as bad as what was happening in the 1840s. So if any of you have attended my programs before, you might know that I am a big, big fan of maps. A lot of my maps for today's program came from this book at the bottom, The Atlas of the Great Irish Famine. This is a phenomenal book. Uh, there's another one that came out around this time frame by the same publishers called uh, Alice of the Irish Revolution. It doesn't just include those things. It includes a lot of additional context for the decades leading up to these things, to these major events. So the revolution and the great famine, highly recommend it. Uh, now, I wanted to show you this map because these are going to be the counties most affected by that famine. Now, historically in the 18th century, you're gonna have most immigration actually coming up here from up here in Ulster. So when you start to get people from these more Southern counties immigrating in the 1740s, it's gonna be because of this. And then, like I said, that drought, that's gonna continue on. So these maps also came from that same that same atlas. Uh, so this would be the percentage change in the distribution of population between 1821 and 41. So what this means is that the population of Ireland leading up to the famine in 1845, it boomed to clo close to 9 million people. It was, at least, it was definitely more than eight. It was somewhere between eight and nine. The population of Ireland today for the Republic and Northern Ireland combined is about six. The population never truly recovered from the famine of the 1840s. Uh, now this map is meant to just kind of show where the population was booming. So you're gonna have massive increases of population in surprisingly these more rural areas. Now this map, which is like a population density, it's just showing where it's most dense. So this is kind of the Belfast region. So Northern Ireland, which makes sense. But still, some of these are, are kind of big for, for 1841, and then everything changes. So this, we have the percentages of evictions. So even though up here is going to be the greatest number of people up here in Ulster, the people who are most affected are going to be the rural poor, the people who will end up being evicted. Uh, those people will then have to walk to try to get to a dock, to try to get on boat, get and take that boat from, unfortunately, if you're from the West, you're going to go to Limerick, uh, not Limerick, uh, Liverpool, I should say, and then take a boat from Liverpool over. That's That would be a very miserable journey, which we'll talk a little bit about soon enough. Um, and then you also have this population decline between 1841 and 51. So some of this distribution has to do with people from these areas migrating here because they, they were kicked off of their land. It's, it's a really kind of depressing thing to think about, but if your ancestor immigrated in this time frame, which a lot of our ancestors have, you can look at a map like this when you're doing research and think, okay, so statistically, where would my people necessarily be from? Because if you don't know, because that's a lot of people, uh, a lot of Irish Americans, they just know that their family was from Ireland and that's about it. And that's a really, really common thing I hear. So this can give you some breadcrumbs. Uh, there are more things in this Alice that I mentioned that can give you even better breadcrumbs. So I highly recommend looking for it. Uh, we have a copy of it here, but it's not a very old publication. So you might be able to interlibrary loan it from another library. Check World, check World Cat. Okay, so that's, that's enough of famine. So let's talk about Ireland after the Great Famine of 1845 to 52. So here's some post-famine statistics. Uh, between 1851 and 1901, over 3 million people, mostly Catholic, they immigrated from Ireland to Canada, the U.S., and Australia. You are also going to have some people going to New Zealand. By the end of the 19th century, nearly 90% of all Irish female immigrants between the ages of 15 and 35 
uh, they were and they were single. So you're going to have the majority of people immigrating in those decades after the famine are actually going to be young Irish women. And a lot of that had to do with uh, the marriage rates of Ireland went really, really down in those decades immediately after the famine. Uh, you had a lot of women who were becoming spinsters, uh, who were just not marrying at all, uh, or they were marrying late. So Ireland, statistically, they were, the marriages were the latest marriages of any other country in Europe in that time period. So you had people, instead of getting married at, say, 20, they were getting married in their late 20s, uh, or even or even 30. Uh, so it was, it was pretty late. Uh, and some of these Irish women, they didn't want to become spinsters and then rely on their brother to take care of them the rest of their lives. So they immigrated. And sometimes it was cheaper for a family to send their daughter to, say, Canada or the United States than to pay for a dowry, because uh, the dowries were, were expensive. Uh, not, every, not every family could afford it. And if you had four daughters, <laughs> that, that's, that, that's a lot. So you would oftentimes send your daughter. And also some of these women, they were sent because they were more likely to find employment than their brothers uh, or other male counterparts. And a lot of that had to do with discrimination in the 19th century. Everyone knows the whole no Irish need apply thing. Uh, so that is going to affect men more than women because most of the Irish women immigrating, they're gonna do things like domestic service. And in that time period, uh, there was such a demand for domestic servants because American women didn't wanna do that work that the demand was actually higher than the, than the discrimination itself. So they would keep hiring these women. They were not always treated very well, but they weren't always treated terribly. It kind of depended on who they worked for. Um, whereas the men, they would be pushed into the unskilled labor force and they're going to have some problems. So the impacts of kind of this mass migration are going to be remittances. So that's people sending money back. Uh, a couple of slides earlier, I had shown a picture. It was a drawing. Uh, probably should have put it on this slide too. Of it showed people depositing money into the immigrant savings bank in New York uh, to send money back to the old country, and they were mostly women in in the picture, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so pattern, sports, and price of immigration. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I know we have a lot of people, or at least a decent number of people in this program who are probably descendant of people who are Scots-Irish, who would have immigrated uh, towards maybe the end of the 1700s. So this, this part is for y'all. Uh, so the primary ports of immigration for that time period would be coming from Derry slash Londonderry, Larne, Belfast, and Newry with occasionally you'll have some people leaving from uh from cork and dublin uh, and waterford down south but this is where most people are going to be leaving from in that time period so that's kind of what's going on there now things do change a little bit um we'll get into how these people were finding their their passage in just a moment Let's talk a little bit about the 19th century. So by the time the Great Famine began, Ireland was already well equipped with the immigrant trade. Uh, so there was a pretty efficient network of communication transport between Ireland and Liverpool. So by the late 1830s, 1840s, two out of, out of every three immigrants who crossed the Atlantic did so through Liverpool. So that's not the rule that your ancestor came through Liverpool. So if you're looking for those ship pa passenger lists uh, and you're not even knowing where to start, try looking through those Liverpool ones first. See if you can find them there. They might not have come through Liverpool, but statistically speaking, it's pretty likely that they did. 
Uh, so the fare to Liverpool was about five to 10 shillings on a steamboat uh, or a fishing boat of some sort or a coal barge. Um, that's how people from Ireland are going to be getting over to Liverpool. Many people traveled next to livestock that was being exported from Ireland. Uh, considering that was also happening during the famine, I highly doubt that the people traveling from Ireland next to livestock, I highly doubt that they missed the irony of that. But I digress. The conditions were horrible. Uh, the ships crossing the Irish Sea, they did not have to have a report on the numbers they carried. So you're not going to find necessarily any kind of record of them leaving Ireland to go to Liverpool, unfortunately. Uh, so there, there just wasn't any record of it. Uh, it was very dangerous. Ships leaving from the West uh, were the most dangerous because they those boats were not meant to carry people <laughs> and they would cram them full of people. And then they had to navigate some pretty dangerous water over here. This side of Ireland, the Atlantic is pretty rough. Uh, if any of you ever, I've tried to visit the Aran Islands, uh, the Ring of Kerry over here in the West. Um, you know, don't ever plan for that to be, oh, this is the thing I must do on this day. Because if the weather is even a little bad, they can't bring you out there. And that's just to get to some islands. Imagine going either from like here and around or down south, which more than likely they would come from the south and go to Liverpool. I mean, that's... It was dangerous, there were shipwrecks, it was, it was bad. Uh, so people would often arrive in Liverpool already sick uh, and it just wasn't a great time. So between 1847 and, 19, uh, 1847 and 1853, as many as a million Irish arrived in Liverpool, either as transients, so people who were just stopping through on their way to leave, to either go to Canada, the US, Australia, et cetera, or as settlers. So people who would leave Ireland and then just stay in Liverpool. A million people between 1847 and 1853. That's, that's a lot of people. Um, so during that famine decade, so 1845 to 55, give or take, the number of Irish immigrants who arrived in North America, who left from Liverpool, was four to five times greater than the number leaving from all the Irish ports combined. So you, you will have people leaving from these ports, as I mentioned, but statistically, like I said, they're gonna probably be leaving through Liverpool. So that's a place to start looking, right? So uh, another thing I do wanna mention is that uh, the United States Congress around 1847, they did pass something called uh, the Passenger Acts. And this was to make, actually make the voyage more expensive because uh, they, they saw the level of destitution and illness arriving in the United States ports. So they passed the stuff to make it more expensive. Um, so in March of 47, the minimum fare to New York rose to seven pounds sterling, um, which was way beyond what most families who are facing starvation in Ireland could afford. Um, so even so, all the tickets that would be traveling during the quote season of immigration that year, they still were all sold. But what we're gonna talk about next is actually Canada because 30% of those uh, bound for British North America in 1847, which, like I said, Black 47, so that's going to be the year with the most death. 30% um, of the people arriving in British North America that year died, and 9% sailing to U.S. cities died that year. So it's, it's kind of a big number, but Canada is really important for those later years of famine, and then moving forward just because it became a more affordable option for people. So some vessels are going to touch port briefly in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick before sailing on to New York, but most of the United States bound immigrants uh, actually got off the boat in Canada before making their way south across the border. So that would be 
again, towards the end of the 1840s. Uh, so Quebec was a pretty important port of arrival. Uh, from there, immigrants went via steamboat, either up the St. Lawrence to Montreal and crossed by land and boat to New England and then trekked down to either Troy or Albany or New York City. Another route that some people would take would actually go from Montreal to Kingston, across Lake Ontario to Buffalo, Cleveland, Toledo, and just to the west. So uh, since we, the Geology Center, you know, we're in the Midwest, this is kind of an important route. Uh, if you cannot find your ancestors in a passenger list at all, it is high, and then they ended up in the Midwest, it is highly plaus plausible that they came this way. That they came through Quebec, through Grosseau, which is basically their version of Ellis Island. Um, there are some records for that, which I believe I put a link to in the handout. If not, just Google Grosseau uh, immigration records and you'll, you'll find it. There's a database. It's not super complete, but it's worth looking at. Um, but I mean, other Irish immigrants moved westward just going by land across Canada uh, before turning south to settle in places like Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota. So it all kind of depends on what they can afford at the time, what time of year it is also, um, and just what resources they had available to them. But most people, if they're going to go to the Midwest, they're going to go this way. So how do people find passage? Letters home, regardless of the era, regardless if we're talking about the 1700s or the 1800s or the 1900s, letters home are going to be the most important uh, part of finding how to get where you want to go. Now, Recruitment through the newspaper from shipping agents, it's actually really interesting. Um, so these shipping agents and also these land promoters in the 1800s, they would put all these ads in the paper uh, encouraging people to, to immigrate to the colonies. Uh, I'll show you some examples of that in just a moment, uh, but the bulk of immigrants who left Ulster for the colonies in this time frame, they're going to come to the United States in these kind of land patent schemes or, or because they saw an ad in the newspaper uh, or it was like a letter home situation. But I mean, this kind of speaks for itself between 1765 and 1775, the majority of the 33,000 immigrants leaving Ulster participated in a land patent scheme. Basically, it was come here, uh, live here, settle this land, and you'll have land. It's that's the basic ex explanation of it. Uh, but it's it's kind of interesting how they would recruit people. Indentured servitude. Now, I do want to make a point in saying that this is not the same thing as chattel slavery. It is not comparable. It is a contract. It is a means of immigration for the poor, uh, even just people who are kind of middling uh, money-wise, because it would oftentimes take a lot of money and resources for someone to book passage and then buy provisions. So that would cost somewhere between three and nine pounds sterling uh, between 1720s, 1770. Uh, those who intended to become farmers in the colonies needed at least 10 more pounds sterling to pay for inland transportation. And then you have land grants and tools and seed, and then you have to survive the first winter. Uh, that's more than a year's wages for uh, the average laborer or weaver. So you would have, you know, increasing numbers of the rural poor coming to the North American colonies as bond servants. Um, but there were about 10,000 indentured servants who left Ireland for the American colonies between 1770 and 1775 as convicts. So that was happening. 
if we were talking about the 1600s, indentured servitude in the 1600s was pretty brutal. It was, it was not great. The treatment of indentured servants got better the following, you know, 100 years during the 1700s. But the thing is, is that when your contract would end in three to four years, now sometimes those contracts would get increased. It would kind of depend. Um, you were given freedom dues. That's paid at the end of your servitude. So that's going to include clothing, tools, seed, and provisions. Um, by the 1700s, uh, land grants weren't offered as much except in newer colonies like in the South. Um, so most of these free servants would become wage laborers on farms or plantations, or they settled as squatters or uh, pioneers like on the frontier. But after the American Revolution, it became not, uh, it, it fell out of favor, the practice by that point. Uh, so it pretty much ceased by 1800 in the United States. And also there were immigrant guidebooks. Uh, so that, that's another thing that you would see a lot in the 19th century. You'll see it some in the late, uh, in the late 18th century as well, but immigrant guidebooks, they exist for not just the Irish. I've seen some for uh, Ashkenazi Jews. I've seen some uh, for other immigrant groups, um, but there'll always be some type of a guidebook with tips on how to find a place to live, tips on places to work, places to worship, that type of thing. Okay, so I mentioned newspapers, right? So I wanted to give you guys some, some tips on what to look for in the newspaper. So when you're looking in the newspaper for shipping ads or anything relating to immigration, I would recommend searching, um, you're gonna wanna look for the names of vessels that have arrived. Now, before I get into this stuff, this page, this is from, I can't really see, it's really small. This is from Gore's General Advertiser. So this is from Liverpool specifically. This is an entire page of shipping ads. Uh, so this is kind of what they would look like. This is from the Belfast Ship News, uh, which I included these here. Uh, you can find these online in uh, definitely the British Newspaper Archive. Uh, you can find them also if you have a paid subscription to Find My Past. The library edition doesn't have it. They have some newspapers for Ireland, but not all. They might have the Liverpool General Advertiser. I'm not quite sure. I do want to point out that the Belfast Newsletter we actually have this here on microfilm and what's been digitized online actually begins in 1800, but we have it all the way back to 1738, which is kind of cool. Uh, you will see in here uh, the names of the vessels that have arrived, uh, cleared out means the departing ships. Uh, so that can give you an idea of maybe what ships to look for when you're digging through the passenger list, if you're going to try to maybe look by ship name. That is one way of doing it. It's hard, but it's a way of doing it. If you're doing research in the colonial era specifically, I would try really broad search terms such as America or colonies or sailing or the names of specific cities like Philadelphia or Baltimore because those are going to be some of the major ports of arrival. Uh, and you'll also want to look at the newspapers located in those ports, ports of departure I mentioned. So these are just kind of two examples I wanted to point out. Um, this one is from Saunders newsletter. This is also a Belfast newspa newspaper. I find it really interesting because it's basically saying, you know, if you're a young man who's been bred to business in this city, uh, and can be strongly recommended. Sail for, Pencil, uh, for Pennsylvania, sail for Philadelphia and Charleston uh, at the first opportunity and you know, you'll have a job. And it's talking about buying and selling goods on commission. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting. So that would be in this time period, one of the things that would encourage people to immigrate. This 
is what a lot of other shipping ads will look like. Uh, this one is from 1828. So this is the Belfast newsletter. Uh, they would, if you're gonna look for passage, like if you're gonna buy your own passage, uh, you might wanna look in the newspaper to see what boats are sailing when. Uh, so to sail the 1st of May, um, during the season of immigration. So keep in mind the weather is a big factor in when people are going to leave. So that can kind of help narrow things down for you as well. Um, and again, just knowing what ships are leaving at one point that can kind of give you some breadcrumbs to go off of. Uh, this one specifically went to Quebec. Uh, it's kind of interesting how they would advertise these ships a remarkably strong ship, sails very fast, uh, has accommodations for passengers in the cabin, second and steerage. I mean, talking about the skill of the captain, it, it's interesting stuff. And you'll see ads that look just like this for later on in the 19th century as well. Uh, you'll see other ones, I'll say, if your friends in America have purchased your passage, can you come to our office immediately so we can get your name? So that's kind of how this was transpiring in this time period. Now, I've kind of given a lot of context. I want to give you two kind of quick examples of kind of where my family fits into some of this. So I want to talk about two people, Sophie Hodges and Maggie McCann. So Sophie Hodges was my great-grandfather's sister and Maggie McCann was my great-grandmother. So let's talk a little bit about Sophie and where she kind of fits in with that bigger context. So Sophie would have immigrated in 1904. Here she is, she was 19. She was working as a domestic servant at the time. Uh, she's claiming that the last place she was living was Dublin. She actually left from Derry. So that's kind of a good example of when I say it is not the rule that people would leave through Limerick, but this is 1904, so it's a little bit later. Uh, her family uh, would have been from County Cavan. She'll have other family from um, County Fermanagh. So she might have been in the North anyway, visiting people before she left. Says her final destination is gonna be New Orleans. So what I really love about these passenger lists uh, from this time frame is they ask all the important questions, like who paid for your ship, uh, for your ticket, right? Uh, her mother did. Now, for a little bit of context, my great-great-grandmother, Joanna Carroll, who by this point, she had remarried to some man named Louis Brandt, uh, she had abandoned Sophie and my great-grandfather into industrial schools in Dublin shortly after my great-great-grandfather Robert Hodges decided he had had enough and he moved to England married another woman had a whole other family now the two of them Joanna and Robert Hodges I we don't believe they were ever married uh, Joanna was Catholic Robert Hodges was Protestant that was kind of a big no-no in the 1880s so we think that that probably has something to do with that, but his leaving left Joanna Carroll alone with these, with these two kids. Now she later on sent money to Sophie, as we can see from here, to follow her to New Orleans. Now Sophie was 19 at the time, so I mean, it had been a, a while. Uh, she did not send money to my great grandfather, which is a whole, a whole thing. Um, so this is kind of an example of chain migration. So those letters home saying, hey, I've, I've immigrated. You should come here. You'll have a place to live. You'll have a place to work, et cetera, et cetera. This is kind of evidence of that. Now, Maggie McCann, she was my great grandmother. Uh, her husband was Sophie Hodges's brother. Her story's kind of interesting, so we'll get into her in a moment. So Maggie McCann, she would have been born around 1890, 91. 
Uh, she was from County Fermanagh. Uh, now, I wanted to show the census. This is from 1901, because uh, it shows her whole family, uh, says that they're Catholic, shows where they're living, all that good stuff. Her father, it says that he can't read, he's 48. He's a farm laborer from County Fermanagh. Now, for those of you who might not have looked at the, the census for Ireland before, there are multiple forms, much like the United States Census. So there's one form that's just for buildings, uh, talking about the actual physical dwelling that a family is living in. And what I wanted to point out is towards the bottom of the screen, if we look at Felix McCann, so Maggie's father, their the description of their dwelling where they live. It says that in this column, this is the name of the landowner. So they are renting okay, like many other people in Ireland in this time period. So this kind of just fits in with the, the wider story of what's what's going on in Ireland. So again, even by 1900, the majority of people in Ireland, they're, they're not necessarily gonna own their land. Uh, this guy up here, James Kelly, he's kind of an exception, um, but it's not going to be what, we, what you would expect as far as people owning their land. Now, fast forward as far as Maggie's story goes, she, as an adult, uh, became a domestic servant in Dublin. 1916, the Easter Rising happens. Now, her and my great-grandfather, Samuel Hodges, had been courting, so to speak. He worked for the United Fruit Company. And when the Easter Rising happened, he sent a letter home to her and said, I don't want to go back to Ireland, but I do want to marry you. Here's some money for a boat ticket and come, come join me. Uh, come to New Orleans, which is one of the ports for the United Fruit Company. He got off the boat in New Orleans, sends her that letter, says, meet me up, meet up with me in New Orleans. We'll get married. It'll be grand. And that's what she does. So Maggie, as you can see at the bottom, Maggie Ann McCann, she's 26. Uh, this Falls Bridge, her last like city slash town of residence, that is actually a very affluent neighborhood in Dublin. And I think that that's probably where she was working at the time. So always do a Google search when you see city or town of last residence, just to see what does that look like? And does that make sense based on what you know about your family? Uh, it says her parents' names, you know, where they're living, it says the name of the cottage they were living in, all good stuff. Now, when you go to the next page, final destination in New Orleans, who paid for her passage, Samuel Hodges, this is my favorite part. Whether to go, whether going to join a relative or friend, and if so, what relative or friend address? Now this is hard to read, but it reads to me like intended, as in like they are engaged because they were not married yet. Samuel Nevin Hodges, and then his address, which he continued to live there for a couple years with her. So again, you know that kind of fits in with. The violence, right? So Dublin was burning in 1916. It was not a great place to live after the Easter Rising. They wanted, she wanted to get out. He wanted to get out, and they did. Uh, and they, he sent her a letter, and she joined him. So I want to take the rest of this time to answer some questions, and you know, hear hear about your family story. You know, where where is your for family story maybe fit into this kind of larger story of the Irish diaspora? I could not possibly get into everything, but I wanted to at least give you a taste, maybe get you interested enough to look into it a little bit more. Thank you, Elizabeth, and I guess we will sign off. Bye. Yeah.